If you have your Bibles, please open them to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. I want to use for a title today, The Great Exception. The Great Exception. Luke chapter 13, when you found the chapter, locate verse 5, please. Luke chapter 13 and verse 5 reads this way. I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. This is Jesus talking to his disciples, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, anybody that would listen. And it's Jesus talking to us today. I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, Ye shall all likewise perish. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, as we today consider some truths from your word, let it sink into our consciousness that we are standing in need. As the old song says, it's not my brother, it's not my sister, but it's me, O Lord, that needs you. And I pray that that would be pressed home today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated. The great exception. It is often the case that in the wake of a major event or crisis, the opportunity to speak truth to the already aroused and alarmed minds of humankind is at its most opportune season. Christ used just such an opportunity in Luke 13. And I intend to use the occasion provided by the tragic events of last Sunday evening to speak to this body some most solemn truths. Our text in Luke chapter 13 and verse 5 is one verse from a passage of six verses in which Christ used two, I believe, current tragic events of his day to speak truth to his listeners. Often when humanity views in stark reality its mortality and vulnerability, minds in which, which in more pleasant times are closed or unresponsive to the gospel will be opened in some slight fashion. It is then that the faithful minister, like his Lord before him, should seize that opportunity and seek to fully penetrate the broken hearts of his listeners with the gospel which is capable of both saving and solacing the soul. In Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5, Christ is told of the tragic slaughter of the Galileans by Pilate, the prefect of Judea. We are not able to pinpoint this event in history, but we have the record of many instances which mirror the details here given. And if we work from known history of the period when Pilate was prefect of Judea, we can lay out a fairly accurate outline of the event that Jesus mentioned in Luke chapter 13. Most likely, the Galileans, whose blood was mingled with their sacrifices, of whom Jesus spoke in Luke chapter 13 in verse 1, was a seditious group of Jews who, with one consent, decided to take up arms against the Roman government in Judea. And when these men found themselves at a decided disadvantage, as a matter of last resort, they probably fled to the Temple Mount, hoping that Pilate would not come there or that God would intervene and save them. This hope for divine intervention can probably account for the mention of the sacrifices in the story. These seditious Jews were not helped on either front. God did not intervene, and Pilate ordered his soldiers to go into the temple courtyard and kill the seditious Jews, even as they were offering their sacrifices. The result is told us in Scripture that the blood of the slain mingled with the blood of the sacrifices in the temple courtyard. This event would have registered on many superstitious Jews as a judgment of God upon his victims. 
The second calamity mentioned by Christ in verse 4 of Luke chapter 13 concerns a tower in Siloam which fell upon 18 men and killed them. Some commentators believe that this event is connected with a building project which Pilate commissioned. A purpose for that project was to build aqueducts to bring water from the pool of Siloam into Jerusalem. Josephus, the Jewish historian, says that the workmen that built that, those aqueducts were paid by the temple treasure money. That was money which was consecrated only for the temple use. Therefore, when the tower fell upon the workmen paid by the temple treasure, killing many of them, these superstitious Jews again saw in this the judgment of God. Jesus, instead of confirming these Jews in their superstitions, chose to use these tragedies to preach timeless truths. Jesus does not confirm the superstitions that these tragedies were the judgments of God upon sinful men. And we should not be quick today to do what Jesus would not. Last Sunday evening in one of our major American cities, a man under the influence of a murderous spirit opened fire upon a crowd of thousands. Minutes later, when he and many others lay dead and hundreds others wounded, these United States began to assess and attempt to comprehend the magnitude of his crimes. Many a superstitious person will see in this tragedy the judgment of God. But if Christ were speaking today, I feel sure that he would not entertain such a suspicion, and neither will I. But what I will do today is attempt to use this recent tragedy to feature some truths which our hearts might be more prepared to hear and receive at this time. I want to be clear that I find the tragedy of last Sunday evening as horrific as anyone else. I have prayed for the wounded, the families of the deceased, and even the family of the shooter. My remarks today is not meant to in any way minimize the tragedy or dismiss the horror and the heartbreak of it. My heart is full of compassion and sorrow over this senseless tragedy. But I will be bold in my remarks today in hope that someone who will hear this sermon might be caused to think seriously about the brevity of life, the condition of their own soul, the state of our nation, and the need of the move of the Spirit of the Lord locally, nationally, and globally. Three relevant headings will guide us through our discourse today, and they are the brevity of life, the bitterness of sin, and the bondage of the human soul. First, let us consider the brevity of life. It is reported that several of the victims killed in the Las Vegas shooting were as young as 20 years of age. Just 20 years and gone. Their breath taken permanently away on the whim of a man who almost certainly never saw the faces of his victims. He certainly never knew their names, their ages, nor the details of their life. It was an indiscriminate extermination of so many souls on a vagary. Persons killed for the pleasure of one man. There it is. Yet another reminder of the brevity of human life. We are told repeatedly in Scripture that our lives are brief. Like a vapor, James 4, 14. Like the grass of the field, 1 Peter 1 and 24. And even men who have lived well past the lifetime common to men do testify that life is still very, very brief. We hear the aged Jacob declared to Pharaoh in Genesis 47 and 9, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. But he goes on to say, few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. All men live as did David, the second king of Israel, with just a step between us and death. We here in present in this room and those who will hear this sermon in the days to come have not a guarantee on our lives. Our years have not been made sure to us. We might one or all be taking our final breaths at this very moment. 
Nothing can secure for us long life, not, nor may our dreams, plans, or projects serve to prolong our years. Who among the slain were aware as they traveled to Las Vegas that they would not return the way that they came? Who among the murdered ones knew that as they entered that space on Sunday evening, they would not exit that field alive? Who among them knew when they purchased the tickets to the event that they were securing their place on the firing line? Life is uncertain. Death is sure. This Jesus presses upon his audience in Luke 13 saying, Lest ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Christ did not mean that his listeners would meet their demise at the hand of Pilate's soldiers or through the collapse of a tower. But he meant that they all would, at a time known only to God, die just like these unfortunate victims of Galilee and Siloam. Let us hear Christ's words to us today in the aftermath of Las Vegas. Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. I know not how ye will die. I know not what will occasion my death. Our chances of dying at the hand of a mass murder in a hail of bullets is not overwhelming. But I tell you that the certainty of our dying is absolute. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Let the mother hear this word, even as she clutches her infant to her breast. Let the adolescent take heed to this warning, though he be not able to fully understand it. Let the young person so full of life and vigor hear this dirge, even as he finds it inconceivable and impossible to envision. Let the middle-aged be aware. Let the elder peer into the mist and watch for that grim specter. For as the wise woman says in 2 Samuel chapter 14 and 14, we must needs die and are as water spilt on the ground which cannot be gathered up again. Neither doth God respect any person. Let the second hand of every clock you hear tick out the gospel truth concerning us all. Dying, dying, dying. For many of us, our lives are over half gone. And even if age does not certify to us that truth, we may still be in the sunset of our years, even though still young. God forbid that I should prophesy this morning, but who among us may face his maker before we gather again? For which may the bell toll or the siren whine? Whose eyes, so bright with life at this moment, might be next closed by the doctor's finger upon their lids? Over which of our heads might the white sheet be drawn first? These are solemn and haunting thoughts to set forth in such a careless and truth-avoiding generation. But truth cares not if it is presented to the wise or fools. It shrinks not from the scoffer, nor does it become mute in the presence of the scornful. As God said to Adam and Eve in the garden, dying ye shall die. So is our breath allotted and our days numbered. The line of time moves swiftly in the direction of eternity. And which of us possesses the power to slow or arrest its determined and unrelenting movement? And who among us can say with absolute confidence, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. We will now consider the second of our three headings, which is the bitterness of sin. Consider it not unkindness on my part or insensitive if I use a few relevant facts about the current place of the latest tragedy to show to us the carefulness which we should take with our own hearts. Sin has a sticky sweetness about it. And this is always presented first to the targeted soul. Yet even as Solomon declares of wine, all sin at last biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. All those who would drink in sin's sticky sweetness must prepare themselves to draw in its dregs as well. 
Though they be bitter and left for last, they are a part of the experience which cannot be escaped. Sin cannot be regulated in a city or a soul. If it be embraced in either, the door is thrown wide open for sordid spirits to take up residence and practice their own specialized brand of evil. Most of our American cities are cesspools of sin. Las Vegas has claimed for herself the name Sin City, the modern equivalent of Sodom. She has embraced sin and made it her chief appeal to the riotous and pleasure seekers of the world. Most every vice known and practiced by men are welcome and promoted there. Though not so labeled, we should not be deceived about her more accurate title that she wears emblazoned in scarlet letters upon her breast, the city of destruction. Mortality is every day murdered in her streets. Youth has lost their innocence there. Many a fortune has been lost at her casinos. Many a marriage has been dashed upon the rocks there. And many more marriage covenants made there in an unholy, frivolous ceremony has served only to make a mockery of the true commitment and the God who ordained such commitments. Homosexuality is embraced by her. Sodomy is not prohibited there. Nudity is encouraged. Drugs and alcohol is poured out like pond water. Her trade is as written by John in Revelations 18 and 13. Cinnamon, odors, ointments, frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, beasts, sheep, horses, chariots, slaves, and the souls of men. Murder is embraced there. Abortion clinics there engage in the murder of the innocent, and in her streets others are annihilated without mercy. Yet for all of this, she has her limits upon what she embraces, encourages, or celebrates. Those limits were tested last Sunday, and we found that the only sin of which we are aware, which is not embraced in Sin City, is the sin of mass murder. This is one city, one sin that Las Vegas did not want. But what she failed to realize is this, that the cup of iniquity has in it both the sticky sweet and the insanely bitter, the delightful draft and the dastardly dregs. You cannot partake of the one and expect to not taste the other. I am in no way saying that the city of Las Vegas or the people who were killed or wounded deserved it or had it coming. I refuse to judge or make a ruling concerning such events. The point I am attempting to make is that when sin is embraced and given license, whether it be in a city, a society, or an individual, no one can control or regulate what sin enters and manifests itself. Amen. The very nature of sin and evil is to take control and to introduce ever more dastardly parts of itself. When sin is embraced, you give it license for all sin. Not only the sins you crave, but the ones from which you will cower as well. You cannot embrace the sins that gratify without experiencing those that horrify. Sin is both pleasure and pain. The pleasure is for a season while the pain never goes away. Sin is the embodiment of Mr. Hyde, who ever so often dresses up and poses as Dr. Jekyll, just long enough to gain access to more souls upon whom it may prey. Oh, here beware. The warning may be in fine print, but I read it aloud in your hearing. That soul that sinneth, it shall die. The wages of sin is death. You may not submit to the one and not the other. You may not choose the one and reject the other. And you will not enjoy the one and escape the other. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. Oh, why will you die, O oh, sons of men? We come now to the third and the last of our headings, the bondage of the human soul. 
The human soul is an addict to sin. There is no denying that we crave it. And with this addiction, as with all addictions, comes a bondage. We are both bound and beguiled by it. And so alluring is its charms that the shackles are only at seasons noticeable to us. At times we become painfully aware of the bondage of sin so relentlessly exerted upon our souls, but then in an instant we are again charmed and become unaware of our plight. Both saint and sinner find themselves seduced by sin. A saintly David is as easily seduced by adultery as the sinful Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4. The apostle Peter can deny Christ just as quickly as the apostate Judas betrays Christ. None are immune from the wantonness of the human heart. We must be saved from it. Not once, not twice, but repeatedly. We must be saved and delivered from our addiction to sin. This is what Christ alludes to in our text, Luke 13 and 5, when he says, I tell you, nay, these were not sinners above all that dwell in Jerusalem. These were not more wicked than the normal man, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. When Christ said these words, looking around upon them that were gathered, he used the word perish. And if we want to have a correct understanding of Christ's words here, let's consider the word perish for a moment. By using the word perish in this particular place, Christ seeks to convey a meaning greater than that if he had just used the word die. All men die. That is the plight of mortality. Christ, though, by using the word perish means to convey the state in which all will die except they repent. Simply put, unless ye repent, said he, ye shall die in your sins just like those men of Galilee and those 18 upon whom the tower fell. Unless you have, says Christ, a change of heart and mind, unless you abandon former dispositions and behaviors with regret, you shall die and your sins shall remain upon you. You shall die in your addiction. You shall die in your lust. And all who die in such a state lose not only the body, but the soul is destroyed as well. This is a grim truth. If it was not for the U-turn sign, the verse should not be considered gospel or good news at all. But the sign is there at the parting of the ways. U-turns aloud. Do you see it? There is an exception here. Ye shall all likewise perish except those that repent. Oh, God most high be praised for that one great exception. I find no hope or joy in the rule, but I find both hope and joy in the exception. There is hope here for me. There is hope there for you. We, though mortal and sinful, might yet be exceptional among men. Our sins would push us past the cross, rushing us to our destruction. But Christ hung there with arms open so that sinners might grasp either hand and be saved. He hung there at the parting of the ways on the precipice of the pit with arms stretched wide in a valiant, selfless attempt to save men from perishing. Just as the thief in his dying hour cried, remember me, so may we now, for this is for us all, a dying hour. Every hour for humankind is a dying hour. Today is the day of salvation. Harden not your hearts, the scripture says. The instructions to be saved are clear in Romans 10, 9 through 11. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. 
For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. The path is the same for all, both saint and sinner, whether our sins be many or few. Sins of age or sins of youth, mature sins or adolescent ones, embryonic or full-grown, the blood of Christ forgives and destroys them all. As a hymn so eloquently has put it from past centuries, those millions have come, there is still room for one, there is room at the cross for you. Only eternity will tell how many who lay dying on that field in Las Vegas last Sunday evening may have took advantage of that great exception. And as their natural lives were ebbing away, perhaps through some repentant prayer, they accepted a new life. Let us hope that is the case for many. But the more important and pressing question is, will that be the case for us or for you today? It is a belief and a prayer of mine that because such a gospel has been and continues to be preached, many of the human race shall stand before the throne of God in some future age. I see them there, the young and old, the saint and sinner, the preacher and the parishioner, the prostitute and the proselyte, I see them all gathered and singing together. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate, on earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Doth ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. The Lord Sabaoth is his name from age to age the same. He must win the battle. And though this world with devils feel should threaten to undo us, we will not fear for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him, his rage we can endure. For lo, his doom is sure, one little word shall fail him. That above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindreds go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Would you stand over the building? There is never a moment when it is inappropriate for a person to come to the front to pray. Yet in these moments, following the sermon, we especially encourage you to present yourself at the altar at this time for an intimate moment with Christ. I am going to pray in just a moment. And as I pray, I invite one and all to come forward. If in the house you do not belong to Christ, you have never accepted him in the salvation and free pardon of sin, please come forward and stand as I pray. And through repentance, embrace Christ. Or if for some other reason you feel the slightest compelling force of the conscience to come forward and pray, please come as well. Lord Jesus, your word tells us of our need of a Savior. I pray for all that are unsaved today. 
Give them the desire and the strength to come forward and accept you as Savior. I pray for those who might have embraced sin which presented itself in some sweet and desirable fashion that they, along with us all, will realize that by embracing one sin, we embrace all. That we would realize that sin is always bitter at the last. Give them the strength to come forward and allow you to evict that sin and its companions. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, I pray. Amen and amen.